Synapses. Synapses are a little bit different, but still important to keep in mind when discussing neural firing and neural functioning processes. When neurons fire, and they send a message from one neuron to the next, you have the axon terminals. So let's pretend that that is my left hand here. The axon terminals at the prior neuron, they need to send the message onto the dendrites, which are my right hand here, of the next neuron in this chain. The problem is, is that these neurons aren't connected to one another physically. There is a small gap between them, and that small gap is the synapse. Another way to refer to the synapse is something called the synaptic gap or the synaptic cleft. Just depends on uh, how you want to refer to it. We typically refer to it as the synapse, but it's important for you guys to know if it were to come up on the AP exam referred to as the gap or the cleft that you would understand what it is. So you can see down here we have the neuron firing. We have the action potential that occurs within the axon itself. We get down here which is this end of the axon terminals and they have to be able to send these messages out to the neurons but there's this small small tiny space this gap right here and that's the synapse so the way that neurons are able to jump that gap so to speak between the axon terminals of this neuron and get it to the dendrites of this next neuron is through sending neurotransmitters neurotransmitters are chemical messengers that are released when that sending neuron wants to jump the synapse and travel across it. What these neurotransmitters will do is bind to receptor cells at the very ends, at the tips of the receiving neuron's dendrites. So you can see these right here. So if you want to think about neurotransmitters as keys to a lock, the neurotransmitters are the key, and then these little binder sites right here at the end of these dendrites these are considered to be the locks. Now, important to keep in mind certain concepts with regard to neurotransmitters. The first is something called reuptake. Neurotransmitters that are all sent out into the synaptic gap, they're going to be reabsorbed to some extent from the sending neuron. Okay, so if they are sent back out, they will be brought back in by that sending neuron. We call that process reuptake. This is basically done in the sense that it's kind of like turning the volume down on a stereo, okay? It's just being done between these messages that are occurring with the neuron uh, and its uh, receiving neurons that follow after that. Once a neurotransmitter has done its job and it's sent that message, it's no longer needed to be sent over and over and over and over again. So reuptake keeps the message from being sent multiple times when that's not necessary. So that's the process of reuptake. And to give you another little helpful hint on this, we have a little scenario of a vacuum cleaner. So vacuum cleaners kind of have a tendency to suck up everything within their path. So think of reuptake kind of like what a vacuum does. It just sucks all of that content back up so that way it, the messages aren't out there just kind of in limbo and constantly sending the same thing over and over to you. You are required to know certain names and types of neurotransmitters simply because they're so crucial to the vast majority of human functioning. The first is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is primarily involved in memory, in learning, and muscle contractions. Interestingly enough, there are certain disorders within human behavior that are associated with either too much or too little of these neurotransmitters. Where acetylcholine is concerned, Alzheimer's disease has been linked to an undersupply of acetylcholine. If there isn't enough of it getting out into the brain, then Alzheimer's disease has a tendency to set in. So ability to remember is impaired significantly and certain muscle functions are impaired as well. Dopamine is involved in movement processes, thought processes, and rewarding sensations. Um, so when we say that, we mean, to some extent, the experience of um, pleasure, essentially, or positive emotions. Associated disorders with dopamine, either an undersupply or oversupply. Parkinson's disease has been linked to dopamine. Schizophrenia has been linked to an oversupply of dopamine. That means that there's too much being released into your brain.
Um, and drug addiction has actually been linked to dopamine because many of the drugs that are out there, such as cocaine, heroin, um, or any of the more severe kind of drugs, they mimic dopamine and establish the feeling of reward or you know they link on to those reward centers that are mentioned here where dopamine is concerned. So what it ends up doing is it can significantly deplete your dopamine levels in your brain if you become too heavily addicted to those drugs. So that's where dopamine is concerned. Serotonin deals with emotional states, so these do basically with your mood, um, and sleep. So depression is the disorder that has been linked to serotonin. If you have too little, an undersupply of serotonin, that's been linked to a particular cause for depression. GABA is involved in the inhibition of brain activity. This has been linked to anxiety disorders. So basically what happens is you are not getting enough GABA in an anxiety disorder. So your brain constantly feels that it needs to be at a state of alert and constantly in overdrive. And that's what has a tendency to cause people to experience anxiety disorders. Then you have endorphins. Endorphins are involved in pain perception. So you are probably familiar with them in terms of the runner's high, how it will help you get through strenuous exercise and you won't feel pain. Um, it's also involved in positive emotions. The interesting thing is that opiate addiction, so we're talking like narcotics particularly, um, Vicodin, Oxycontin, Roxycodone, those are the ones that are typically most well known to students. Those narcotics mimic endorphins in your brain. And so that's why people become so heavily addicted to them. Because if you're not experiencing pain um, and you're experiencing lots and lots of positive emotion all the time, you're going to want to have that at a, at a fairly consistent level all the time. So opiate addiction can very much influence endorphins and their function within neurotransmitter usage. So how neurotransmitters work, it's important that you keep that in mind. There are basically two ways that neurotransmitters can function. They can be either agonists or antagonists, and I'll get into what that means in a second. A neurotransmitter is going to bind to the receptor cells of the receiving neuron's dendrites in a key loctite mechanism, so we talked about that. And each neurotransmitter has its own unique chemical composition that equates it with its lock, so to speak, its receptor site. So it's basically like taking a puzzle and fitting those pieces into one another and locking them into their proper place. The receptor site will only accept or recognize one type of neurotransmitter at any time. So as I said, neurotransmitters can be either agonists or antagonists. In this structure, an agonist is going to mimic a neurotransmitter. So by that we mean it's going to act as if it is a neurotransmitter. What this will do is it will increase activity of neurotransmitters by inhibiting reuptake. So this is considered to be kind of the master key. It's similar enough in structure to a neurotransmitter that, can, that it can mimic its effect. So let's talk about opiates again. Opiates are a type of agonist because they mimic endorphins. So anytime you take a narcotic, we'll use Vicodin for example, the Vicodin that gets into your brain, it acts as an agonist, and when it's released into the neurotransmitter structure of the synapses, it will bind to that receptor site and act as if it were an endorphin rather than a chemical that's comprised of opiates. An antagonist, on the other hand, what it's going to do is the complete opposite. It's similar more so to the receptor site, and so what it will do is it will block action of neurotransmitters. It's not similar enough that it's going to be able to stimulate any activity. It's not going to um, increase activity like an agonist will. Drugs and how they influence neurotransmitter activity, we essentially just got to that. They will either mimic it and act as a neurotransmitter or they will act as the receptor site and decrease reuptake. So hopefully I didn't overwhelm you by how much content we just covered. I know it was a lot. I know that much of it is probably brand new content in terms of vocab terms. I would highly suggest that you go back and look over these one more time for yourself just to make sure that you have a really strong understanding of what all this means.
purely because everything we cover from this portion of the unit on is going to stem back to the whole concept of neurons and neural process and firing. Other than that, if you've got any questions, just let me know.